evening. My name is Ludovica Serratrice and I'm the current director of the Center for Literacy and Multilingualism at the University of Reading. I'm delighted to welcome you to our final date in uh, the Be Multilingualism online series that we've had. Uh, over the last couple of months. I think many of you are already familiar with the center, with CEL, um, because you have attended some of our events, either in person or online. Um, for those of you who are new, um, CELM's mission is to conduct research, to engage with practitioners and the general public, and to train the next generation of researchers. Our research spans five broadly interconnected themes, language and literacy, education, migration, neuroscience, and health. And tonight, the topic is indeed health. Uh, I'm also very pleased that this is an opportunity um, to introduce our new director. So my term finishes at the end of July. And uh, so Dr. Holly Joseph from the Institute of Education at the University of Reading will be taking over as the new SAM director on the 1st of August. So I'm very pleased to welcome Holly uh, and, uh, and just leave the floor to you now to introduce our two speakers for tonight. Thank you, Ludo. Um, so today's um, event following um, our four previous events uh, showcases the incredible variety of research we do at SAL, not only in terms of topic, but also in terms of approach, methodology and impact. So, so far we've covered the themes of language and literacy, education, migration and neuroscience. And today, as Ludo said, we'll be presenting research within the health theme. One of the unique things about the research within this theme is that there's a real focus on non-European languages, in particular South Asian languages, um, in populations with language impairments. If you're familiar with the literature on multilingualism, you'll know that there's a large bias towards European languages, and we're very proud at SELM um, to be one of the few research centres looking beyond this narrow linguistic view of the world. So we have two fantastic speakers um, today from our health, our health theme, our Peter Bose and Johanna Taha. Our Peter is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology and Clinical Language Sciences, and her research focuses on understanding the interplay between cognitive, linguistic and speech motor processes during language production. And she looks at this interplay in neurologically impaired speakers, such as those with aphasia, dementia and Parkinson's disease. Her findings can then help to develop better intervention strategies for language production deficits in these neurologically impaired populations. Johanna is a final year PhD student in uh, clinical language science and has background in speech and language therapy. Her research interests include typical and atypical acquisition of language in monolingual and bilingual populations. The aim of her PhD project is to characterize the linguistic symptoms of developmental language disorder in Palestinian Arabic speaking children. And she'll be talking about her project today. So um, during um, and after the talks, please do ask our speakers um, questions. If you want to ask questions, you'll see at the bottom that there's a Q&A section and a chat section. So please post your questions in the Q&A section. We will answer them um, live. We'll ask our speakers live if we have time, or we might type the answers if we're running a bit short of time. If you also want to just comment or start a conversation about what you're listening to, please do and do that in the chat um, box. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll pass over to our first speaker, Arpita, who is going to give us an overview of the health theme. Thanks, Arpita. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present our work uh, within the cell theme, within the health theme uh, in cell. So um, I'll share my screen now. Uh, okay. Are you guys seeing the first slide? Yeah, you might want to put it into slideshow. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So I'm a, as um, Holly said, I'm at the School of Psychology and Clinical Language Sciences, and I have been associated with SIN, um, CEL uh, from the start, since the time it started. And in the last few years, under the leadership of Ludovica, we have. Um, I wanted to showcase some of the things we have achieved within this health team. Um, so the main driving force of um, health and bilingualism, so we are interested to look at the interaction of bi and multilingualism with health. And in that, um, I envision this or we envision this as, you know, the impact of bilingualism or multilingualism on 
healthy aging and diseases. So, you know, if you are a bilingual or multilingual, then does your aging process is different or not? And because there are some uh, literature which has come to show that if you are a bilingual or multilingual, then you have some cognitive reserve, some cognitive benefits, and it has also been shown in dementia. But less studies are available in diseases. You know, what happens for multilinguals uh, with dementia, um, with stroke or multiple sclerosis. So that's one way we have looked into the direction of bilingualism and uh, diseases. But the, in the other hand, we have looked at if you have a disease, a neurological disease or any other disease, and you are a bil bilingual or multilingual, then what happens? So do you, does both your language break down equally or well, certain language aspects are preserved or preserved or why something is better preserved than other. So within these two kind of thinking, we have um, done several research, several activities, and I thought to share some of the overview of what we have been doing in CELM followed by some of the research findings. Now, one of the um, achievement of the CELM is that you know, obviously it's a research center. We have been able to attract researchers and research activities globally, both nationally and internationally. But I think what Holly said is our ability to attract researchers or partners from non-European um, countries. So for example, India, Malaysia, you know, Middle East. And of course we have partners and researchers from um, European countries, also North America and South America. And I think that is something I'm very proud of to uh, have it in CELM that we are looking into things which are underexplored or languages or population which are underexplored or you know, underrepresented in literature as well as in society. In addition to developing research collaborations and research activities, because of CELM, we have been able to attract several um, expertise, you know, it could be clinical expertise, it could be um, academic expertise through various meetings, conferences, fellowships. One of my colleagues actually was a uh, winner of a British Academy International Fellowship and they gave out 50 of these awards and he's the only linguist in those to come and work in CELM from India. So. I think it is a big achievement from CELM and also for these countries to come here and to contribute their knowledge in research, pedagogy, or their experiences with us. So because of CELM, we were able to attract various people. Um, in addition, we are always have tried to link uh, our research or our findings with you know, practitioners or people who are using consumer of this research. So for example, in 2019, we did a, a workshop on bilingualism and neuropsychology for speech language therapists. And we had a speaker from uh, Marco Calabria from Spain, training the interpreters for a speech language pathology student I saw in the list Brevely was is here. So that was very popular and very well attended. And Ludo told me today that it is will become a part of our curriculum. So, in terms of you know extending our influence not just by one of workshop but making changes in our curriculum i think these are also you know achievement worth mentioning and i feel very strongly about ensuring that you know we train good researchers whether they're phd students postdoctoral uh, fellows or even research assistant because of several projects in cell you know, these are some of our PhD students, you will hear Johanna talk. And all, most of their research have looked at some aspect of bilingualism and health. Um, and uh, right now, some of them like Abhijit is starting an academic post in Manchester, Julia is a postdoc in UCL. Um, you know, they are going places. And I think a field remains healthy if you have more well-trained researchers. So I also think because of CELN, we are able to contribute to the development of new set of researchers who can carry out the work. Now moving to uh, the, just a sampler of the um, 
type of research we have done. This is a work carried out by Dr. Avalado and her colleagues from Spain and Reading. And you know, those who know multiple sclerosis, it's a autoimmune disease which attacks the myelin sheet of the nerve and um, which results in impairment in the transmission of signal. In her research, what they looked at, they compared monolingual versus bilingual on executive control measures, the measures of cognitions, monitoring and inhibitory control. And the main finding what they found is that for bilinguals, they were similar to their controls in their you know, cognitive control processes, but monolinguals with MS had worse monitoring abilities. So in that research, they took it as, it is one of the indication that um, bilingualism can, um, might counteract cognitive deficits related to MS. So the, there has not been any systematic experimental work in bilingualism and um, multiple sclerosis until now. So there are a lot of epidemiological studies looking at, you know, looking at the back records of people. But I think, you know, there is big potential of doing more experimental studies to look at the processes or what goes wrong in certain health conditions. I don't have a watch, so I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but um, okay. Now here is example of one of our students, uh, Emily Wright, who is a PhD student. And um, when she told me first about her project, I was perplexed and I thought, what a brilliant idea. Like, you know, I never thought of it that deaf children could be speaking two languages in addition to sign language if they're using. So Emily was um, got this funding from ESRC and now she's studying in a spoken language bilingualism in deaf children. And I really um, felt you know, enlightened about you know, the different aspects of bilingualism and different health condition one can take. And again, Emily's study is a very systematic. It has, it has a components of understanding how two languages develop in deaf children who, who are bilingual but also more linked and clinical aspect is, you know, how do speech language therapists, what are the advice they are given to in terms of what languages they should choose to speak with their children if they're deaf, you know, what are the professional views? So through these different types of research, you can see that there is this uh, importance being given to the basic research, but constantly through the projects, you know, the students or researchers has is trying to actually ensure, um, you know, their research is relevant or in the context of the clinical practice or in the context of the life. So um, here are a couple of examples. Now moving to some of the work I have done, and this has been done in collaboration with people from India, US, Reading. And I work with, um, uh, mostly with aphasia, aphasia and post-stroke aphasia or dementia. Right now it's only limited to Alzheimer's disease, but I'm open to all types of dementia. I thought to spend a couple of minutes to explain the difference between the two. Both are due to neural damage to your central nervous system, that is your brain. And in stroke, um, what you see there is, you know, the flow to the blood, to the different brain areas get damaged. Uh, get disrupted. It could be because of a hemorrhage or it could be because of a clot. And depending on where this clot is, you will see uh, certain areas of the blood flow is stopped. And depending on which area the blood fl flow is stopped, you will have deficits in the function. And the function I'm most interested in is uh, language. Okay. And in contrast, the brain pathology is very different in people with dementia. In Alzheimer's cases, there is degeneration of the tissue, the brain volume shrinks, and there is atrophy of the cerebral cortex. Now, because of the different pathology, the pathology is completely different, and also the onset. In stroke, it is a sudden onset, right? There is a neurological event. But in Alzheimer's, it is very insidious, right? Slowly it occurs. There is hardly any documented, much documented literature on what happens, especially in Alzheimer's in L1 and L2. 
And also in post-stroke aphasia is in South Asian languages, there are hardly published research in terms of linguistic description of these deficits. And why is this important is, this is the map of, or the tree, language tree. This shows, you know, how different branches, how languages develop. Can I use a, I'm just trying to see if I can use a pointer. Let me see. Uh, mouse, spotlight, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you see the language is developed from one base and it goes to, you know, European branch or Indo-Iranian branch. And you see English is here with the big population speaking it. Related languages are German, French, you know, Dutch. Spanish is not very far. But when you look at South Asian languages, you know, Bengali, Hindi, Marathi, they are very far apart. Now, the literature, most of the literature, you know, it has consequence in which language the studies are done. And I'll show you, let's see, it's not going to the, so if we are studying uh, Spanish English bilinguals, they are more similar in structure to one another. However, if you're studying Catalan and Spanish, they are much closer than English and Spanish. So what we get from results of these studies are different between Spanish and English versus Spanish and Catalan, as opposed to if you are studying between Bengali and English. And these languages are very different. So this is just to show that languages are different depending on how they originate, you know, how they proliferated through the world. Now, in my research program, I thought to showcase a few things. One was to highlight you know, the importance of developing language-specific markers for diagnosis. Because, um, and in this case, I will talk about AD, Alzheimer's disease. Second is I thought I would talk a little bit about you know, our need to embrace uh, bilingualism in our clinical practice or in our thinking. Okay, And third is you know, what are the implications, um, again, in when you are testing clinical population, if you're testing them in non-dominant language. So just to give you an example, here is somebody who had stroke and uh, somebody with very uh, severe Broca's aphasia, that means limited production. And you don't have to know the task, but this is, they're telling the frog story. Okay, it's a in a story of a boy who lost his frog. But you don't have to read all this, but you can see somebody with Broca's aphasia have very limited production, just nouns, not making complex sentences. And this was his whole output, you know, this just this much, okay? And he was, this is a, some, somebody in Calcutta who is surrounded by Bengali people, is and raised in a Bengali household, but he was more proficient in English because of his profession. He was a marketing and salesperson. As opposed to he's saying the same story in Bengali, you see all these English words in here, okay? Um, so, you know, these are the type of data you are looking at. And, you know, when you're studying bilingualism in impairment, you can start to see how the data looks. This is in contrast with here is somebody with mild Alzheimer's disease. And this is just one third of the whole transcript. So you can see they're producing a lot, you know, they speak a lot. But again, if you look at the production, um, we don't have time for this. You will see the story is not going any further. You know, they're circumlocuting, they're having lots of revisions. But what, so, these are English samples, obviously I have Bengali samples as well, but this is to give you a contrast of how different disorders can show um, break down the language in different way. So why it is important to study um, these features in Bengali? Now, connected speech has become a key thing in the last, you know, four years, for five years, there are four systematic review on connected speech because you know, when you ask people to tell story or describe a picture, it's a very, very quick way of eliciting a language response. It work, it is data from various levels of language, grammar, morphology, you know, lexicon, 
as well as semantics. And clinically, it is easy to do. There are some uh, very good guidance in the literature to really you know, cl classify these errors. But what we find in English uh, language, some of the key features which are shown to be impaired in Alzheimer's disease, for example, you know, they make morphological errors, you know, problem with tenses of verbs or inflection of nouns. And one key feature is, you know, very high proportion of pronouns. So they cannot say the boy or the frog or the dog. Um, they use, you know, pronouns. Um, so these are features of language. So my query was, what happens when you have a different language, which is structurally different? And it's quite uh, mind boggling that 90% of the literature is in English speaking persons with some research in French, Brazilian, Portuguese and other listed languages here. And as I said, showed that languages differ in the structure. And in 1988, this is Michael Paradis had said, how the language will break down will depend on the structure of the language. And this is completely ignored in the literature, at least for Alzheimer's disease. And I think it's because a lot of the people in this literature are neurologists and not necessarily linguists. You know, aphasia literature is much better. So if that is the case, you know, language structure will depend on the language itself. We really need to consider if our approach to utilize linguistic English criterion for classifying, you know, other difficulties with other languages, okay? So here is just an example of some of the features that is different from English for Bengali. Bengali is a pro-drop language. That means you can drop the pronoun when you can infer it. It has a separate, different word order from English. It is a flexible, more flexible word order. It has postpositions and it has something called reduplications. More importantly, um, in terms of um, um, inflection, which is, you know, how inflection is, it has a very rich and agglutinative inflection. So it's a very complex inflection processes. Now, I will not go in detail because it's not a linguistic class, but um, let's see, sorry. Here is again, some examples of these speakers. Uh, is somebody healthy speaker and you can see, you know, long sentences, well embedded sentences with good um, word order, as opposed to somebody with Alzheimer's disease, you see lexical items missing, often verbs missing, uh, noun object missing, object missing, often overuse of the same construction or, you know, repetition and revision. So there are clear differences. But in terms of when we compare the differences we noted in these AD with English speakers, what we found that AD speakers in Bengali did not overproduce pronouns, okay? And that is, was very characteristic. And as well as they had no difficulty with inflection despite it being so complex. So, you know, one of the thing in the English literature is if it is complex, then mean you will have more difficulty, but it, it is complex, but it's more regular and systematic and they did not show problem with their inflection for the tokens they produce. So this was one illustration of that we do need to develop more language specific, um, you know, uh, characteristics in describing our clients. And in the long run, when we have enough data, enough number of replication, we will be able to decide more clear characteristics for um, diagnosing these populations. But if we don't even know what's going on in these languages, we are nowhere near making better diagnostic tools. Um, I think I have five or six more minutes, okay? So next is embracing bilingualism in clinical diagnosis and treatment. So here, again, if you are a bilingual or multilingual, you know people code switch. If you are talking with people who knows your languages, they code switch automatically. And however, if you look at the literature, they will say bilingual code switching is pathological. So here is an example of somebody, a young man, 28 year old man who had broker's aphasia, Hindi, English bilingual. And we asked him to produce, describe this picture in Hindi and in English. Sorry, I'll get my um, pointer. Uh, yeah, 
And you can see he is hardly producing anything in a park, a tree, a, and English is I'm sitting, mom, trees, leaf. So, you know, his output is very limited when we asked him to stick with one language. And, you know, we, we were uh, theoretically interested to see what, we, what happens when we ask him to use any mode he, you want or just use, describe something. So we gave him the same task of the frog story. This is one third of the content, you know. But you see, he produces way more production, which is, you know, correct and functionally more relevant to him. So this brings the question is, you know, if you come across clients who has more than one language in their repertoire, would you then limit them to one or allow them to produce whatever they can? So this was a very interesting demonstration. And because we are scientists, we are more interested in the type of code switching, amount of code switching. We did various analysis, which is he was switching more than control uh, participant, but, you know, it is one strategy for this person to communicate. So I think um, from clinical perspectives, we need to think about how we advise our clients and what is useful to them. Again, we cannot just advise based on a limited set of studies, right? We have to have a big body of literature to really give them the best advice. Now, coming to the third point is, you know, there's a lot of discussion in literature about dominant and non-dominant language. And I have done this research for donkey's ears is verbal fluency in aphasia and dementia is, you know, you ask somebody to tell the names of animals or tell the words beginning with letter. In all sorts of literature, you will see this, okay? And I find it fascinating. But more interestingly, when I started working with bilingualism, I just thought it's opportunity to see how the performances are in L1 and L2, and you know what are the cognitive underpinnings and the linguistic underpinnings of their performance. But the most interesting thing what we found is uh, here is a case of a group of person with Alzheimer's disease, and we tested them on Bengali, which was their dominant language, and English, which is non-dominant language. And typically, semantic fluency, tell me names of animals, are always better, usually better for healthy people than letter, right? because our brain, our semantic system is organized in concepts, right? That's why the green spot. However, one of the characteristic features of Alzheimer's disease is you have difficulty with the semantics, okay? And difficulty in the semantic trials is one of the diagnostic features. Like if you see somebody performing poorly on semantics, but better in later, it's an indication that something is going on. If I did, if you did not have this Bengali data, non-dominant dominant language, if you, in your clinic, you just had this English data, what you see is these people have depressed semantic score. And that will be a red flag for you to say, okay, he or she is going towards Alzheimer's disease. Having said that, this is really dangerous because if you look at his dominant language, he's performing, they're performing all right. I mean, they are depressed and controlled, but you know, there is no semantic breakdown as such. So this shows that, you know, the breakdown in this case is more in the non-dominant language. And if clinically we are just having our diagnostic framework within the non-dominant language, then we run big risk of misdiagnosing client with very, um, you know, devastating labels, okay? Or maybe we underestimate their performance. So this was one of the, you know, for me, um, I love processes and cognition, but this was an eye-opener for me to see that, you know, what the data tells you in terms of what you understand and you can implement clinically. So just to wrap up things, um, I think in the last few years with the leadership of Ludo, as well as colleagues across different themes in the university, we have made important contributions in our understanding of the relationship between health and bilingualism in different aspects across different impairments, across different population languages. And we have used a wide range of methodologies 
we had undertaken translational activities and training of future researchers. And this talk, I, when I was making, you know, it was obvious that what could be our future directions. And I, um, you know, felt that we have to increase the breadth of the research questions we explore. So right now it's still very based on impairments and understanding the basic of the processes, but given the diversity of bilingual experience and the type of populations we have, there are a lot of opportunity we can um, explore, you know, in terms of expanding the research questions. I really think to facilitate, it's important to increase and improve collaboration opportunities, both nationally and internationally. And, you know, of course, increasing the number and impact of translational activities. So with that, I should stop and um, I'll first stop this thing and then stop share. So thank you for your attention and uh, I am happy to take questions. Holly, I think we are maybe taking questions at the very end. Does okay. that suggest yeah. that okay? Yeah. So yeah. give people a little bit more time to think. Yeah. Please post them in the QA. If you have any, you can post them during the next talk and then um, we can answer them all at the end. And I forgot to mention my email was there in my slides. Also, feel free to get in touch. Um, um, I hand over to Johanna now. Thank you, Avita. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. I'm just going to share my slides. Oops. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. brilliant. Okay, um, so today I will be speaking um, to you about the results or some of the results of my PhD project. Um, as Holly mentioned earlier, the aim of my PhD is to um, characterize the profiles of developmental language disorder um, in Arabic speaking children. And in this talk, I will be focusing on um, the grammatical abilities of Arabic speaking children with and without um, developmental language disorder. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the condition, uh, developmental language disorder is diagnosed when um, a child presents with difficulties in understanding or using a spoken language. Um, and these difficulties usually occur in the absence of any obvious reasons. So children with DLD usually um, have normal hearing, normal neurological development and normal motor development. So um, their difficulties are primarily in language and it's they're not parallel to other or they're not in proportion with uh, their development in other areas. Um, developmental language disorder is a condition that is likely to persist into school age and beyond um, into adulthood. And it, it's not likely to be uh, resolved without intervention. In terms of prevalence, DLD affects approximately 7% of children. And this is equivalent to uh, uh, two children per classroom. Um, as having a language uh, difficulty would certainly have an impact on uh, the child's quality of life. And particularly, uh, we see negative consequences in the areas of academic achievement. As children with DLD tend to uh, perform poorly in school, many of them um, also have dyslexia, which is a reading difficulty. And also many children with DLD um, um, struggle to socialize and communicate with peers, um, um, which definitely has consequences on their emotional well-being. Therefore, um, given that developmental language disorder has negative impact on the quality of life of the affected children, it is very important that we diagnose it at an early stage uh, where we can provide um, early intervention to the children so that we can help them reach their full potential and reduce the negative impact of um, the disorder. Um, so how does developmental language disorder affect grammar? Um, we know that different languages have different grammatical systems and it would be interesting to see or uh, how does the symptoms of DLD manifest across languages. For example, in Germanic languages such as English and Swedish, um, English and Swedish 
um, speaking children with developmental language disorder uh, show severe difficulties with their use of verb inflections. For instance, uh, English speaking children with DLD have severe difficulties with their use of regular past tense ED, um, uh, auxiliary B form uh, or the do forms and so on. Um, on the other hand, children with developmental language disorder who are acquiring uh, rom romance languages such as Spanish or Italian, they do not seem to have difficulties with verb morphology Rather, they have more severe difficulties in their use of articles or object uh, um, um, pronouns, which are called cletics. In Semitic languages, such as Hebrew, uh, children with developmental language disorder seem to have, again, mild, more mild difficulties with uh, verb morphology, and they, had, they have more severe difficulties in their use of complex grammar, such as relative clauses or the use of WH questions or passives and so on. What we can summarize from here is that um, DLD manifests differently across languages and that the uh, severity as well as the nature of the grammatical difficulties uh, that we see in children with developmental language disorder, um, it depends on the type of language that they are acquiring and the grammatical system that they are acquiring. And therefore it is very important to look at the language specific uh, grammatical difficulties uh, um, in children with DLD. In this project, we focus on Arabic. Arabic is a language with, uh, it's a Semitic language with a rich morphology. Um, although it is spoken in many language, in, in many countries, um, in the Middle East especially, um, very little research is available on how grammar develops in children with and without language disorder. Um, in clinical practice, um, there is still an there is still a lack of language assessments that are available for Arabic speaking populations. Um, for example, the diagnosis of developmental language disorder in Arabic speaking countries, it relies mostly on uh, qualitative information such as picture, um, such as picture description activities or language sample analysis. Um, and the interpretation of these qualitative data are not always um, consistent as it depends highly on the subjective judgment as well as the clinical experience of the speech and language therapists. Um, what this means is that children with developmental language disorder who are acquiring Arabic, they are at a high risk of being misdiagnosed or uh, not being diagnosed at all. And therefore it is very important to try to look for new ways uh, uh, or to establish diagnostic tools that we can use to improve the accuracy of identifying Arabic speaking children with developmental language disorder. In this project, we will be trying to identify the grammatical areas um, that are problematic for Arabic speaking children with DLD and um, maybe see how can we use these areas to improve the diagnosis of the disorder. Um, in this project, we uh, are looking, as I said, at the grammatical abilities of Arabic speaking children and we're particularly interested in two areas, which is the use of verb inflections and also um, sentence repetition. Um, in terms of verb morphology, here is an example of how um, the Arabic, uh, the Palestinian Arabic verb um, morphology paradigm looks like. It, it looks scary. Um, it's obviously Arabic is a language that has more um, verbal inflections compared to English. So um, in, a, in a sentence in Arabic, the verb must agree with the subject in terms of um, it, the gender, person, as well as number. Um, in our studies, we focused on these uh, six forms here. Essentially, we were interested in examining the ability of Arabic speaking children in using verbs to describe the actions of other people. Um, and this included the use of masculine versus feminine verbs or using um, the number agreement, which is the use of singular versus uh, plural verbs and so on. Um, to do that or to study these forms, uh, we wanted to elicit them. So we use a picture description task. Um, essentially, the child was shown a picture and was asked to uh, um, describe what the person was doing in that picture. So to elicit present tense, for example, we asked the child to describe what is the boy doing now? Um, so the answer should be Bishrab, which means he is drinking, which is the present tense form that we're interested in. Um, and we also did the same to elicit past tense form and so on. We administered this task to uh, two groups of children, uh, five-year-old children with and without developmental language disorder. Um, 
Now for the sentence repetition, uh, as the name implies, um, sentence repetition is a task in which children would be asked to repeat sentences. Um, and many uh, researchers have shown that in order to be able to repeat a sentence, it should be filtered through the individual's uh, grammatical system. So it is a window into the grammatical uh, abilities of uh, children. Uh, and many studies have shown that children with developmental language disorder perform poorly on sentence repetition tasks compared to typically developing children. Um, in order to um, assess the sentence repetition uh, abilities of Arabic speaking children and also look at their grammatical abilities, we developed um, um, a task, a sentence repetition task. And in that one, uh, we assessed 13 areas of grammar. And these included um, grammatical areas that are known to be problematic for Arabic speaking children, and also grammatical uh, areas that are known to be problematic for children with developmental language disorder across languages. Um, for example, we assessed their ability to repeat questions, to repeat passive sentences, to repeat object uh, and relative clauses or subject relative clauses and so on. And here is a sample of how it looked like. And again, we administered this um, task to two groups of children, a group of children with developmental language disorder and another group of um, age match, typically developing children. Both are monolingual speakers of Arabic. Um, so this is what we found so far. First, for the verb morphology difficulties, um, if you look at the graphs, generally, um, the red bar represents uh, the scores of children with developmental language disorder, whereas the uh, blue uh, column represents the scores of the typically developing children. What we can see generally is that children with developmental language disorder, they perform below um, their typically developing peers. However, they're not performing so poorly on the task, like they're doing well. For example, if we look at tense, uh, on figure number uh, on figure A, we could see that they were able to produce past tense verbs with 92% of accuracy, which is really high. Um, however, we could see that they had very specific difficulties with some forms, such as uh, present tense, which they produced with 70% of accuracy. Um, with the feminine verbs, it was 85% of accuracy, and so on. So generally, what we could see here is that verb morphology is not as problematic to, is not that problematic for children with developmental language disorder. Um, to compare this with what we know about other languages, um, here is an example um, that was extracted from a study on English speaking children with developmental language disorder. Um, if you see here, uh, basically in the English study, we could see that the children with developmental language disorder, they were only able to produce past tense with 25% of accuracy or 29% of accuracy. Whereas in our study, it was much higher. Um, and this indicates that, again, uh, Arabic speaking children with ELD have less difficulties with verb morphology compared to other languages. In terms of uh, the results of the sentence repetition task, um, Generally speaking, again, uh, children with developmental language disorder appear to have difficulties with uh, uh, grammar. Um, we could see here that we have two graphs. The first one, which is figure number three, it looked at very simple um, grammatical structures such as present tense, uh, possessive pronouns, or past tense. So these are just inflections. Whereas um, another level in the sentence repetition task looked at very complex uh, grammatical structures, and these included uh, conditional such as if statements or object relatives and subject relatives and so on. What we could see here um, that for the typically uh, developing children, their performance remained stable across both the simple versus the complex structures. Whereas for children with developmental language disorder, they seem to, their performance seemed to drop very poorly um, at the, when they repeated complex structure, st structures. And this indicates that um, grammatical, grammatically complex structures are uh, an area of difficulty for Arabic speaking children with DLD. Um, this is an example of the type of errors that children with uh, language disorders had made on the sentence repetition task. Um, generally speaking, what we found is that children with DLD, they, they have a difficulty with grammar and that difficulty is usually manifested by omitting several parts of the sentence. So they usually omit function words, they omit uh, grammatical uh, um, inflections and so on. Sometimes they even um, omit 
uh, content words, which are which are actual words that do not have any um, grammatical function. Uh, but yeah, this is just an example. So if you could see here that the target was an object relative, whereas um, subject number seven, they literally omitted everything. They omitted the articles, the, they omitted the um, relative uh, word, they also omitted um, the verb and the pronoun that was attached to the verb and so on. Yeah. So to summarize, what we found is that um, in Arabic speaking children with developmental language disorder, they have difficulties with um, their difficulties with verb morphology are mild and they're very specific to um, some of the forms and these included present tense, feminine verbs and plural verbs. And also um, these difficulties were less severe compared to what has been reported in English. Um, you might wonder why, what's the reason um, for this reduced difficulty with verb morphology in Arabic? And um, one theory has been proposed to, um, to suggest that children who are acquiring richly inflected languages, they acquire grammar more easily. And um, one of these theories, the morphological richness account, it assumes that children with developmental language disorder have limitation in their processing capacity. And um, in languages such as English, where most of the grammatical cues are in um, the word order. So children with DLD, they will um, basically use their limited processing capacity or abilities to um, process the grammatical cues that are so obvious, such as word order, and they the remaining, um, let's say, processing abilities um, will be devoted to the acquisition of um, inflections. However, in English, uh, um, inflections are very sparse, and because children have with DLD have very, um, um, again, a limited um, processing capacity, they would have to listen more they do not have enough exposure to these inflections and this is why they have difficulties with these um, um, inflections such as the past tense whereas in um, virtually inflected, inflected languages such as Arabic children tend to have um, more exposure to inflections because inflections are everywhere and inflections are what carry the grammatical cues um, in that language and so they, they're more exposed to the inflections and that's why they have a higher accuracy in producing these. In terms of sentence repetition, um, we identified several areas that are problematic for children with DLD and um, generally we found that they had more difficulty with the use of uh, grammatical structures that involve changes in word order such as passives or WH questions or object relatives and so on. And these same structures have also been um, identified as problematic in other languages. Um, how does this um, help clinicians? So the whole idea of this project was essentially inspired by my work with um, Arabic speaking children with DLD. And the whole um, aim was to try to see, again, what are the problems that the children with DLD are facing and then use these uh, uh, problems to improve the diagnosis. So um, the study provides speech and language therapists with information about what are the grammatical areas that they need to look at when they assist children with uh, uh, um, developmental language disorder in Arabic. It also um, points out or provides them with information about the grammatical areas that they should consider when they um, develop intervention programs for these children. Um, the tools could also, we, the tools that we've developed here, such as the verbal elicitation task or the sentence repetition task, it could also be used uh, by speech and language therapists to monitor the progress of um, um, therapy in these children, as in see how effective the therapy was um, and so on. Yeah. Um, lastly, during my work on this project, um, as well as other colleagues who are doing um, research on Arabic, such as my my colleague and lab mate, uh, Zakiya al-Sadiqi, we noticed that there is a, a lack of awareness by parents, um, teachers, as well as educators about developmental language disorder and um, the implications it has. Um, and so we decided to um, take a step or take an initiative to raise awareness about developmental language disorder. And we started with um, a Twitter account um, in which we provide um, resources, we summarize, um, 
studies that are being conducted on Arabic as well as other languages and um, um, just steps for parents and for um, speech and language therapists as well as educators on how to deal with children with developmental language disorder. Um, yeah, it's just to introduce a bit of more evidence-based practice in the speech therapy field in the Middle East in general, especially in Arabic speaking countries. That was it. Thank you for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting and incredibly clear. We do have some questions. Um, so the first question is a very simple question, um, um, but an interesting question from Katie. Um, Katie asks, is DLD more prevalent in certain languages? Um, I'm not sure, Katie. I'm aware of two studies so far, and one of them was in the States, and the other one was in the UK. Both are English-speaking countries, and in both of them, it was around like seven to eight percent. But I'm not aware of any studies that are on other languages. Cool. Okay, that's something we can. I mean, I suppose first of all, you have to know about the difficulties that children it, speaking that language show before you can then assess it yeah. well, right? Yeah. Um, Another question um, from Fee Larson, um, who was really interested to know that past tense is difficult to acquire in English um, and, um, and experienced uh, that, that, that um, children found this difficult uh, in her own work and came to the conclusion that time was the most difficult concept to teach. Um, so she yeah, would be interested uh, to uh, hear your opinion on this. So I suppose it's about kind of the relationship between grammar, past tense, in grammatical terms and the concept of time. Do um, you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't really have any thoughts on that. <laughs> because I was mostly focused on grammar rather than um, looking at concepts beyond that. Um, mm. I mean, it's certainly the case that different languages vary hugely in how in, in the use or non-use of past tense, right? And how they how how they conceptualize time in terms of grammar. Um, but yeah, I don't know any more than that. Are Peter or Ludo, do you have any thoughts on that? Wait, I lost my whole thing. Uh, well, I guess um, expressing a concept of time, I mean, you know, it's, it's a relational concept, right? Because mm -hmm. Um, you're talking about, you know, you're using grammatical devices, whether it be morphology in the case of English and many other languages, or adverbs in, in, in some other languages that don't express uh, tense via morphology. But it is a relational category because you have to put, you know, speech time and then, you know, in, in reference to whether an event is taking place now at the same time as when you speak or had you know, taken place before or will take place in the future. So I think you know, there is some evidence already that children with ELD have problems with relational categories like predica predicate argument structure. So for example, when you've got a verb uh, and you've got you know, a subject or an object, so these things may be complex. So potentially you would say, I don't, I'm not aware of anything that has looked at time and tense, so to speak, you know, mostly um, it's uh, it's looking at tense uh, to express, you know, grammatically express whether it, like I said, it's via morphology or not. Um, but again, um, in other relational domains, like for example, spatial prepositions, that's also something that, can, that, that is to potentially complicated because again, it's got the, you know, you have to relate to elements rather than just a fixed element. Same thing with pronouns, you know, they're difficult because you, when you hear a pronoun like he, she, they, you don't know who it refers to. You have to find an antecedent, something that comes before and then make this relational, um, uh, you know, put, put together these two elements in, in a relational framework. And, and that's also why it's difficult. Um, to do and, and you know in cases in, in, in languages that do use um, pronouns um, children with um, DLD have issues with them typically I'd say. Can I just say something to Katie earlier about the prevalence of DLD? I mean I think you know you, you would think that in principle there really shouldn't be um, you know, differences across languages, you know, we know, and then Johanna has shown this very clearly, that there are differences in the way in which it manifests, right, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, like you were saying, Holly, you need to know what the 
um, you know, the expression of DODs in each language. I don't think there are a priori reasons um, for why there should be differences, although you may find, you know, one of the predictors um, as well, or, you know, risk factors, for example, is, you know, one of them is being a boy. Um, uh, some of them, are, you know, are also social deprivation. So you could also argue that there may be context, but not across languages, across societies, but as a function of, you know, um, socioeconomic factors where you may find a higher incidence of DOD. But from a, you know, theoretical point of view that there shouldn't be, you know, languages are not more or less prone to DOD. I think, you know, maybe it's societies for reasons that have got nothing to do with, you know, grammar and processing, um, that then you may find a higher incidence potentially, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's the same for dyslexia, I guess. It manifests in a different way. And so it might be less likely that a child would be diagnosed with dyslexia if they, their language is a trans transparent language because they won't be inaccurate, they'll just be slower. And so they can actually read relatively successfully in terms of their accuracy. Whereas in English, if you're dyslexic, it's you're very, very getting clear. away from it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, another question um, from uh, Srishti um, asking you, Johanna, what's your main takeaway for scholars of bilingualism who are starting to do DLD work and DLD scholars who are interested in expanding to bilingual populations? <laughs> Big question. Um, I think generally is to take into consideration that when we look at a language of a child, whether you want to study it, um, like basically for research or for clinical practices, that it's very important to look at the other language that the child is um, being exposed to and taking that into consideration um, to have a better idea of the language profile of these children. Um, um, but that's it for me, at least for now, nothing comes to my mind at the moment. Um. Oh, Peter, I've got a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you know in, in the UK, is it what, what's the what's the normal way? So somebody with Alzheimer's, for example, or another neurological condition who are going to be assessed in terms of their language. What's the kind of the default or the the, the, the policy of deciding what language to assess them in? Is it usually in English because that's the societal language or is it? Is it more nuanced than that? And a judgment is made about their dominant language or preferred language? Um, that's a very good question. And, you know, the it, it's a burning topic across the clinical services. And especially in our, I mean, this Berkshire, we have such a diverse population. They're very interested in doing that. And actually we have a small grant to explore that, not necessarily what language they are tested on, um, but you know what tools they have to begin with. First of all, amongst the clinician, there is not much, not for all, but many clinicians, this awareness is not there, right? That how two languages can fragment and you know um, what tools we will use. And so often the default is um, English because most of the clinicians are uh, English as a language. At times they, often help, have interpreters, but some of the aspects you can get from actually speaking and understanding mm. is not captured. Mm. Interestingly, many resourceful clinicians have modified some type of those tools mm. to use for uh, their population. So they are very creative. They're working with very limited resources or limited tools. Um, but there is no systematic policy as such what language they will uh, mm -hmm. test. And many a times they, there is not much information also they gather to get, you know, um, how, how the language breaks down. And I have, in speaking with clinicians, you know, neuropsychologists or speech therapists, they often say, even uh, the, you know, the MMSE, which is a very gold standard of cognitive decline, when they do with elderly population of um, here who are you know, working as even professional capacity, they perform poorly on those tasks. And that's nothing to do with the cognition. It's just, you know, they're not used to this sitting down and doing cognitive tasks. So it's a very, um, actually very big area of concern for the NHS and especially 
in the last little while with all the you know focus on diversity and inclusion it's um it's a very pertinent question but do you think things are sort of ripe for you know developing and becoming more inclusive we just need the tools and the I mean, what we need is for British people to speak more than one language, right? I mean, that's and, that's and one of the issues, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's there, but also awareness. You know, people mm. are not aware that, you know, if you, that example of this bilingual, you know, if they would just have gone with um, English, you will diagnose somebody with AD. I mean, that's really devastating to get. Yeah. Uh, so... I think first is awareness, then having better training, and then, you know, of course, tools. And, but there is a big clinical need uh, to develop these tools. And it's not just here, you know, in this UK. There are tools, in, there is a lot of activity across the globe in Spanish, Portuguese, because there are already established research streams there. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to South Asian languages, my God, they are trying their best, but some of the tools are really not capturing you know uh, yeah. what it should capture but yes that's my hope the yeah. environment yeah, is you can, rich. you can push it forward we've just had a bit of a late question i just it's seven o'clock but i'll just quickly ask it um so it's for you our peter i think maybe or maybe you ludo because you're the supervisor mm -hmm. aren't deaf individuals bilinguals if they read and write in a language other than sign language Yes. Uh, yes. So the, it's a, it would be a case of bimodal bilingualism. I think, you know, most of the time when we're talking and I guess, you know, apart from and even Emily, who um, Peter sort of name checked earlier and who is doing her PhD on deaf bilingual children, she's actually looking at children who speak who, who are deaf but that thanks to cochlear implantation or um, hearing aids actually acquire two spoken languages. So we're not looking at bimodal bilingualism, um, but yeah, obviously, and I don't think there is really anyone in sound that is looking at that um, right now, but yes, bimodal bilingualism, you know, you can be bi you know, bilingual in English and British sign language, for example, of course, and then, you know, multilingual in yet another language and maybe yet another sign language. I mean, uh, yeah, you can definitely, it's just a question of modality for sure. Yeah. Thanks. So we've come 7.01. We've done very well for timing. Thank you so much um, to both our wonderful speakers. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and this is our very last uh, session of um, multilingual, being multilingual. Thanks everyone who's, I know I can see from the participants that some of you have been to every session. So thank you for your loyalty. Um, and we hope to run some more sessions soon. Um, but until then. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. And just a word that I, I will try, sort of we'll try our best to, to put um, the recordings of these sessions uh, online on our YouTube channel and everybody who's registered for this will receive an email to that effect. Thank you very much. See you, you next year. Bye. Bye.